Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Gus Noble. On behalf of our partners, the Scottish Government USA, National Trust of Scotland USA, the American Scottish Foundation, the Scottish Business Network, the British American Business Council of Chicago, and the Saltar Foundation, I thank you for joining the Chicago Scots, Illinois' first and oldest not-for-profit organization for today's special program. Welcome all. I particularly want to thank those of you who believe in the Chicago Scots principal charity, Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care, where an incredible record of safety during this pandemic has been made possible by the commitment, COVID carefulness and love of the extraordinary people who live and work in this unique elder care community. 2022 is Scotland's year of stories. This year, all around the world, whether they're Scottish by birth, by heritage, or simply by inclination, everyone everywhere is invited to celebrate the amazing depths of Scotland's spirit of creative writing and storytelling. Scott Stevenson, Lochhead, McDermott, Rowling, Welsh, and 2020 Booker Prize winner Douglas Stewart. The list of Scottish writers is, as the saying goes, as langs my arm. Of course, today is the birthday of Scotland's best known writer, the man whose pen and poetry speak of truth and of beauty for and to all of us. In honour of Robert Burns' birthday and in honour of poetry, I'm delighted that from the Orkney Islands, uh, Scotland's new national poet, Macker Kathleen Jamie is with us today. Now, before I introduce Kathleen, a word on how today's discussion will work. Today's programme will last about one hour. Kathleen and I will chat for about 45 minutes and there will be 15 minutes at the end for questions. If you have a question, please ask it at any point during today's presentation in the Q&A interface where it will be seen by me and my colleagues and I will ask Kathleen the question on your behalf. So poet and essayist Kathleen Jamie was born in Scotland in 1962. Her work concerns nature, travel and culture. Her poetry collections include the Overhaul, which won the 2012 Costa Poetry Prize, and the Treehouse, which won the Forward Prize. Her non-fiction includes the highly acclaimed Findings, Sightlines and Surfacing, all regarded as important contributions to the new nature writing. Surfacing, in fact, won both the John Burroughs Medal and the Orion Book Award here in the United States. Her most recent poetry collection, The Bonniest Company, won the Saltire Scottish Book of the Year Award. And to get us started today with a reading from Robert Burns, I am honoured to welcome Scotland's macker, Kathleen Jamie. Hello, good evening. Well, it's evening here, a very dark and stormy night on the Orkney Islands, as Gus says. And I'll begin this evening's, uh, I nearly said entertainment, I'm not sure it's entertaining, but I'll begin with Robert Burns' poem to a mountain daisy and turning one down with the plough in April 1786. We modest, crimson tippet fleur, thou hast met me in an evil hour, for I mun crush among the stour thy slender stem. To spear thee new is past my poor, thou bonny gem. Alas, it's no thy neighbour sweet, the bonny lark, companion meet, bending thee mung the dewy wheat with speckled breast, when upward springing blithe to greet the purpling east. Called blew the bitter biting north upon thy early humble birth, yet cheerfully thou glinted forth amid the storm, scarce reared above the parent earth thy tender form. The flaunting flowers our gardens yield, high sheltering woods and was shield, but thou, 
Beneath the random build of clod or stain adorns the histy stibble field, unseen, alone. There, in thy scanty mantle clad, thy snowy bosom sunward spread, thou lifts thy unassuming head in humble guise. But now the shear uptears thy bed, and lo, thou lies. Such is the fate of artless maid, sweet floweret of the rural shade, by love's simplicity betrayed and guileless trust, till she, like thee, all soiled, is laid low with the dust. Such is the fate of simple bard, on life's rush, rough ocean luckless starred, unskilful he to note the card of prudent lower, till billows rage and gales blow hard and whelm him o'er. Such fate to suffering worth is given, who long with wants and woes is striven, by human pride or cunning driven to misery's brink, till wretched of every stay but heaven, he ruined sink. Even thou who mourns the daisy's fate, that fate is thine, no distant date. Stern ruins ploughshare drives elate full on thy bloom, till crushed beneath the furrow's weight shall be thy doom. Uh, thank you very much for that stirring reading. Uh, thank you, Kathleen. Can you tell me what qualities do you admire most in Robert Burns? Do you know, Robert Burns is just the most extraordinary figure. And I, I can't personally imagine Scottish culture without him. I mean, imagine just imagining he's not there. I actually can't do that. But he seems to uh, generate and encourage passions of all sorts, you know. Mm. Mm. Even now he's, be, he's being a hell. Oh, I don't know. I, 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 just, you know. I find it a bit tedious, actually, all the time. You know, what, was, what did Burns think? What did Burns do? What did Burns believe? We don't know. Right, but right. What I do know is that it, it, he made it obvious and made it possible that a person of, of humble birth and you know, not, not a higher education, could become a poet. And that's what mattered to me, you know. Mm -hmm. It never occurred to me otherwise, because I was always brought up with, with Burns. One of the few books in our house was with Burns when I was a kid. So I'm not bothered about it being a man, but I am I'm concerned by the fact that somebody who was a smart, extremely clever, but without a higher education and a, a humble birth, could go on to have a literary life, and why not? Do you have a sense of what, whether there was something in the culture that he grew up in or in him himself that allowed him to, to become the, the kind of the person that, that clearly lots of people revere and, and that inspires? Well, it would be both, wouldn't it? He would, have been, he would have been immersed in the Scottish culture of song and balance and storytelling of his day. I mean, immersed in it. Mm -hmm. So if you sucked all that in as a child. And obviously something in himself, mm. something driven, something, something. Yeah, I think he must have been quite driven, actually, don't you? It must have been the, the uh, that, that kind of culture of, of kind of inspiration and support was clearly something that, that you found. Can you tell me about your own journey to, to becoming who you are today and, and the work you've done and which, which other Scottish poets may have inspired you along the way? Well, my own um, my own journey was was actually a very simple one. Like many teenagers, I began writing quietly in, in my bedroom when nobody was looking. I mean, many teenagers do that, and I just kept going. And I found in in my writing a a, a place which was secret, which was mine, which nobody else knew about, and where I could I could do that very teenage thing, you know. And I realised I was getting more and more interested in it. And when I was in my mid-teens, I found my way to a writing group in Edinburgh. We're going back to the uh, 1980s now. And there I found some other people also intent on the writing. Some of them are still friends. They've been friends now across 40 years. Yeah. And so those immediate contacts were crucial to me. Rather than lofty poets you know, from ages gone by, but actual living people whom I could meet on a weekly basis, who may not be famous, you know, but, but they were crucial to my own development. And immediately 
above them, as it were, with a generation of Scottish writers who are still alive and one could just see passing on the street in Edinburgh. So I'm thinking of Nora McCaig, for example, Hamish Henderson was alive, George Mackay Brown here in Orkney, not that he ever came to Edinburgh, but he was alive. Edward Morgan was alive. You know, that generation were, were proving again to me that a life in poetry was possible. Quite inspirational. So when, when you accepted the Macker's role, you were quoted in the press as saying, it comes at a perfect time in my life, and it's a role that comes with a lot of opportunities. Mm -hmm. What makes this the right moment for you? I'm 60 this year, and so I, I think I can say my mature years are upon me, and I think it's a role that um, requires a certain amount of maturity. It ought to, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, for, for a long while, I was reluctant to take on a very public role, um, partly because I had young children and I felt you know, protective of them. But they're now adults and find it hilarious, so, so that doesn't matter anymore. And um, I was of a, an age when I thought, right, if I don't do it now, make that move into a more public role, I never will. You know, I've got my back catalogue, all my books behind me. You know, let's just throw myself into it and see how it goes. And so far it's been grand. And would you talk to us a little about what the Macker's role is and what excites you about the responsibilities and the opportunities of the Macker's role? Do you know, if I fiddled around in my computer here, I could fetch up the actual job description, there is one. <laughs> and it speaks about, um, it speaks a lot about encouragement and ambassadorial role, you know, just encouraging the, the appreciation, production, just, just doing poetry. You know, and encouraging people who might not think themselves into it to say, you know, it's fine, you know, just give it a go. And uh, I was at a funeral this morning. Of course, a poem was read because, you know, that's, that's what it does. We reach for it in times of celebration, in times of sadness, in, in extremely private moments. We reach for poetry, great public declarations you can do in poetry. Mm -hmm. you know, so, and, um, the job is, is simply, not well, simply, it's not simple, but to, to be that um, glue, to try and bring people together, to encourage them, to allow them to create, to allow them, encourage them to read. You mentioned that you, you consider yourself to be a private person, uh, but you've already been in the news with First Minister Nicola Sturgeon and participated in the opening ceremonies of the Scottish Parliament back in October. Are you adjusting to having a more public profile? It looks like, I have to say, I have to confess, I did enjoy the opening of Parliament. <laughs> I did enjoy um, being up on a sort of balcony and declaiming down to the Queen and Prince Charles and, and the First Minister and all the other, yes. <laughs> what was that like? I, I saw the video and, and it's inspirational. And I'm it was a I spent a lot of time concentrating on the poem which after all is what mattered, but once I was confident that the poem was there, I was the new, you know, messenger. And um, yeah, it's fine. You know, the, the poem you read, The Moral Bird, it's an astonishing poem. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's incredible. I, I, once I, I found it, you know, to, to I, I felt the weight of time, but also the weight of a, a singular moment in time. And I'm struck that The Moral Bird was, encouraging and challenging uh, Scotland's leaders. W would you mind reading it to us? I would love to read it to you. It's quite long. And um, when, when I wrote it, we had, it was written expressly for the opening of Parliament, of course, but we also knew that we had the COP26 summit the very next month. So I was already thinking, you know, to our, to our parliamentarians and to our global leaders, you know, you've really got to get this, act on this. So that was bearing down on me as well. The moral bird. Suppose we begin with a glacier, bearing a massive stone, till the world warms, leaving the boulder abandoned, alone through aeons of desolation, before a wind brings crumbs of earth, tundra forms with reindeer, then one day a bird from an unkent eart, the future, circles appraisingly and drops a gift 
a hazelnut, which sends forth the tree that inaugurates a forest, pine green and very bright. The wood holds sway a thousand years, then feels the first axe bite. The rest, we cry history, Kai and castle, empire, mine and mill, till we win the right to be governed according to our will. Which brings us to this chamber where, at our provisional behest, today you take your places. Well, here is a first request. Don Bird's back, wheeling over, bedraggled and dismayed, she soared to sight the horizon, but returned afraid. She soared to sight the horizon, her wings flashed gold, but turned back, preparing herself to tell what must be told. And perched on a certain boulder, her lifelong friend, she's ready, so please listen as she calls you to attend. All things pass and change, that's I've been the way, but the stark vision I saw there must be allayed, for that no lone child or woman or man will be enough. You'll want your multifariousness when it all gets tough. Stones, it won't be sufficient just to sit in your doubts and say nay. Trees, don't be waving your arms about in some new breeze every day. It's maddening your own age old injustices remain, but how your human influence invades the wild domains. On you depend the puddock's leap, the hare's breath, the drone of summer bees, the whales dive in the ocean, and you need them. So please, let the morrow bird's hansel be wisdom, leavened with music and song. We seek good governance, Parliament. Act bold, be kind, stay strong. Great poem. Thank you. Thank you very much. You, you mentioned COP26, and there was a, an incredible nature poem, a national nature poem um, that you shaped for, for more than a thousand, from more than a thousand entries that, that yes. came uh, out of a singular, single line of poetry. Uh, could you tell us about how you pulled all that together and how it was created for COP26? I will. Um... I wanted very much to, to well, as I just explained, part of my remit, part of the job is to encourage the writing of poetry. And that's an intimidating thing to write a whole poem. Mm -hmm. So I thought, why don't we crowdsource a poem? Why don't we ask everybody to send one line? You know, and I said, let it start with the word let's or start with the word today. And it had to be a line of nature poetry. And in they came. As I say, we had about a thousand single lines arrive. And I was sent them all on an almighty spreadsheet, you know. And so I typed them all out and laid them all on the floor and thought, right, where do I begin with this one? But very quickly they began to, to fall into themes and into, they just arranged themselves. Mm -hmm. I was the new curator of this, I didn't write it. And we have now got this wonderful poem, which is living in a Tupperware box in my desk. It's a small <laughs> little piece of card. And I, realized I could make any number, any different number of poems from these single lines. You know, you could rearrange them and you had a whole different poem, like a kaleidoscope, just a tweak, a whole different pattern. So we took a number of them and made some lovely film poems with them. They became the script for these, these beautiful poems, but that only used a fraction of the lines I'd received. So we're thinking how to make a, a bigger event out of the, the whole, the material, which as I say, is still in a Tupperware box on my desk. But it was such a pleasure and, you know, not to have to actually write it, it was easy. <laughs> Isn't that how David Bowie wrote some of his best songs? <laughs> yes. And did the experience convince you that there is uh, a poet at the heart of every Scotswoman and man? I'm convinced that everybody can, can get over the fear of writing a poem and just use their senses, look, listen, attend for a minute, write one line, and then you're done. And then if you write another line, fine. By the time you've got seven or eight, you know, you're on your way to a poem. Mm -hmm. But it comes, to my mind, it comes back to the senses all the time. It's about giving yourself a moment of attention. Everyone could do it right now, you know, just by looking out the window, 
looking at the floor, looking anywhere, listening, and just for that one moment, putting down what you, you've noticed. And from that, a whole poem can grow. I think it was maybe Paul McCartney that said that he found songs hanging in the air, you know, the words and the music. And yeah. They kind of came to him in moments of inspiration. You see, it's, you use the word inspiration. I'm not terribly sure I believe in inspiration. You know, I tend to believe in observation. You know, so it's not being hit in the head by some great idea. It's just attuning your, your senses to look and listen for that for that starting moment. But another word with I, though, if not inspiration, is integrity. I, I know that you've often described poems as, as having integrity. What, what do you mean by that? I think I mean that it's not actually possible to lie in a poem. And if you do lie to yourself, you're not lying to anybody else, if you lie to yourself, the poem will fail. And the reason often that uh, if you're writing a poem and it is failing, it's just not happening, is because perhaps lying is too strong a word, but you're not being utterly truthful with yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, oh, we live in a world of noise, you know, of, of the language is so noisy. We've got all this political noise going on. We've got the noise of social media. We've got an incredible amount of, mm -hmm. you know, and I do think that people are understanding that and all the great swirl of language that surrounds us, poetry is a place of linguistic integrity and integrity of ideas. I believe that. I'd like to believe it. I do believe it. And perhaps it says why poetry is so important you know, like a voice that the world is listening to at this particular time in a, in a poem is addressing, you know, the pandemic and, and climate change, you know. These are big things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what a moment. But you, you certainly have, have put into words the, the feelings that many of us are, are uh, experiencing at the moment. And this Scotsman, for one, thanks you for doing it. Um, <laughs> T tell us, if you if you would, how you came to write the poem What the Clyde Saw after the Glasgow Climate Conference COP26. Well, what the Clyde said, I thought, after the COP summit was over, and of course it was, it was in Scotland, it was very close to us geographically and, and spiritually, uh, as it was drawing to a close, it felt unresolved didn't it? I think we can all agree now we felt that whatever we'd hoped hadn't happened and the whole thing looked like it was going to sort of fray out into nothingness and I felt the need to um it needed um, I think I'm trying to resist the word closure but it needed some way of, of closing it mm -hmm. and I'm also extremely interested in in the way that poetry can speak as other creatures and speak for other creatures I think that's absolutely integral absolutely necessary in, the, in this moment of environmental breakdown. And the river is, to my mind, a living creature. And I thought, what would it be like if the, the river spoke? All this great debate and this noise is going on in the riverbank, the bank of a famous once industrial river. What would, it, what would the river say? Mm. And once I had that idea, the poem came, came very quickly. What would the Clyde say? And how would it say it? You know, what accent would the Clyde speak in? These are <laughs> questions that you know, poets like to ask. So the, the idea of this river flowing past the arenas where the, the COP26 discussions were taking place and eavesdropping on it all hmm. gave me the poem. Fascinating. W would you mind reading it to us? <laughs> yes. If you're interested, the Clyde speaks in a Glasgow accent. What else? <laughs> I and, was hoping uh, I would. And even when I was a child, um, you know, 40, 50 years ago, it was still hugely industrial. There was still huge shipyards, which, you know, the shipbuilding industry collapsed very suddenly. And the Clyde has had to reinvent itself, as we all do. What the Clyde said after COP26. I keep the heat. I'm cool. If asked, but you never ask, I'd answer in tongues hinting of limbs, of leaving. Nethin, Kelvin, Cart, but neutral, balancing both banks equally as I flow. Do I judge? I mind the hammer swing, the welder's flash, the heavy steel-built hulls I bore downstream from my city. 
And maybe I was a blatherskite then, a wee bit full of myself, when we seemed guy near unstoppable. But how can I stomach any more of these storm rains? How can I slip quietly away to meet my lover, the wide armed ocean, knowing I'm a poisoned chalice she must drain, drinking everything you chuck away? So these days, I'm a listener, aye. Think of me as a long, level, liquid ear gliding slowly by. I heard the world's words, the pleas of people born where my ships once sailed. I heard the beautiful promises. And sure, I'm a river, but I can take a side. From this day, I'd rather keep afloat like we folded paper boats, the hopes of the young folk chanting at my bank, fear in their spring bright eyes. So hear this, fail them, and I will rise. Great, very powerful poem. And that, that came to you quite quickly, didn't it? It did do, just across about four days, which is a record for me. What, what's your process normally like, or is, is there one, does it matter? Does it, does it vary from poem to poem? I tend to begin a poem trying to pretend I'm not doing it, you know? I don't sit at my desk and go, now I'm going to write a poem. So I, I like to make notes on the backs of old envelopes and scrappy paper that doesn't matter. People give me beautiful notebooks you know, and I can't use them because they're just too lovely. So poems begin, as I say, in backs of old manila envelopes, that's the favourite. And I write down, I was looking the other way, trying to pretend I'm not doing it. I write down a few odds and sods and scraps. And then, and then it builds. And then the long, often long process of redrafting takes place. And that can happen across many weeks. Mm -hmm. to, to knock it off in a few days was, was a record, you know. So I've got piles of drafts here deep for, for poems. You know? Thank you for sharing that one in particular with us. I think it's a very powerful one. That, uh, Langston Hughes is a great um, favorite poet of mine and, and he uses the, the imagery of rivers very powerfully also in, mm -hmm. in his work. Um, the Sierra Club considers you to be one of the leading women's voices on nature writing. Really? Paving the way for a new wave of female authors committed to conservation. Could you tell me about your views on the gender disparity in nature writing? Well, do you know, I had never heard that until you told me about the Sierra Club. I'm, I'm, I'm actually astonished. <laughs> um, what can I tell you? I can tell you when I began um, in earnest to, to think about writing about the natural world. It was about 20 years ago now. And I began doing this thing. And it seemed to me that, that there was an empty space there. You know, that nobody seemed to be doing much about this. So it's strange to say now, but it did feel like walking into an empty room. I was quite wrong, of course. I soon discovered there were one or two others, but, but we, were, we were a few and it had been considered a bit cranky, you know, up until then, and for reasons that we may or may not go into, but it had been out of fashion, a bit cranky. Nobody wrote nature stuff until suddenly we all began again. And in the early years, there were very few women, it has to be said, very few women, very few writers of colour involved in, in nature writing. I think in the subsequent 20 years, it's changed unutterably. And I can tell you that um, when I began, there were two or three of us, Robert McFarland, obviously, there's not very few, and you could go into a bookshop and there was nothing, you know, there was no nature writing shelf. And now, huge sections of, of bookshops are giving over to nature writing. That's happened in 20 years. Yeah? Incredible. And, and the books that are on those shelves are now increasingly by women. You know, there's enough um, nature writing is, is moving into memoir, is moving into trauma writing, is mo moving to fiction. There's a whole, a whole genre has been developed in, in those 20 years. Mm. I'd love to take a moment, as I know everybody that, that's listening today and, and will listen in the future, to, to hear some more of your poetry. Would you be willing to share some of your nature poems in particular, please? Well, 
I'm going to read a couple of poems, if you don't mind, from, from my, my selected poems. So these, this book spans the work of a good 20 years, if not more. And there are poems in here which take their, their start point from aspects of the natural world. Whether they're nature poems or not, is open to debate, but... As I'm on Orkney and it is stormy, I'll read a poem called The Beach, which I wrote here some years ago. The Beach. Now this big westerly's blown itself out. Let's drive to the storm beach. A few brave souls will be there already, eyeing the driftwood, the heaps of frayed blue polyprop rope cut loose, thrown back at us. What a species, still working the same curved bay, all of us hoping for the marvellous, all hankering for a changed life. A poem, um, excuse me, called The Spider. I mentioned before that I, I was kind of fascinated by the way poetry can speak as another creature, as well as speaking to other creatures. And I think this is a, an essential part now of environmental writing. Somebody has to advocate for the other creatures mm -hmm. and give them voice. And poetry can literally imagine your way into another creature and give it voice and how that happens. Now you could make it happen, make it plausible, is, is fascinating to me. So this poem is called The Spider, and the spider is, is speaking. When I appear to you by dark, descended not from heaven, but the lowest branch of the walnut tree, bearing no annunciation, suspended like a slub in the air's weave, and you shriek, you shriek so prettily, I'm reminded of the birds. Don't birds also cultivate elaborate beauty, devour what catches their eye? Hence my night shift, my sulfur and black striped jacket, poison, a lie to cloak me while exposed, I squeeze from my own gut the one material. Who tore the night? Who caused this rupture? You, staring in horror, had you never considered how the world sustains the ants by day clearing, clearing, the spiders mending endlessly? Beautiful. Thank you. And um, a little poem, perhaps. I've never been to the United States except for a few days in Manhattan some years ago. And um, oddly enough, sometime in a, an epic village in Alaska and nowhere in between. <laughs> but this, is a, this is the poem I wrote in New York and it's about the birds of Central Park. Wings over New York, I call it. One of the Central Park red-tailed hawks is hunched in a leafless maple, pecking at a polythene bag. When it flies, its talons entangle with the plastic so it plunges head down, dreadful winged pendulum, and everyone gasps. But with three strong wing beats, it frees itself and soars. Where are they nesting? Someone asks. I heard in Dakota this year, above the American Natural History Museum. At the pond side hop hermit thrush, fox and swamp sparrow, and elsewhere in the ramble sounds a tiny NYPD siren, a starling, in a red oak. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, we'll have to have you stop between Alaska and New York next time you're over in this part of the world. Come visit <laughs> Chicago. A couple of those poems mention birds, and I know that you have a great passion uh, for birds, which, which I share with you. Ever since I was a wee boy, my magic place has been the Bass Rock. That's right. And, and gannets are, are purely and simply magic to me since, since I was a, a wee boy. In fact, in, in my son's bedroom, I painted a mural of the Bass Rock with well, gannets fantastic. flying over to <laughs> Chicago to, to inspire and protect Langston and Bobby. Oh, in in uh, Findings, which was John Berger's favourite book of the year, you mm. reconcile family life with your passion for birds and birding. Tell us why you love birds. I think they're there. I think they're, they're, 
You can look out the window and birds are there, unlike mammals, which are much more secretive and, and fewer of them. Um, when I was 40, which is 20 years ago, I decided my birthday present to myself was going to be a little course on bird identification. So I took myself off for two or three days in the company of expert naturalists and decided now, at long last, at 40, I'm going to learn my birds. I wish I'd done it when I was 10, but at 40 it was. And I commend it to anybody. You know, the world is just opens up to you. Birds, a decent pair of binoculars, and the world is transformed, you know. So it's it's a, a, something I found later in life. It wasn't a youthful thing, but I'm, I'm very glad I've done it. And now I can't, I can't look out the window. I can't look out a train window. I can't walk down the street without checking what's going on. And that act, that physical act, makes you look up. Yeah. And that is good for the soul, you know. So I'm not an expert birder, far from it. And I, I don't read... Um, tomes about individual species and then their nesting habits and whatnot, but just their, their presence flitting across my life matters enormously to me. There's a, an artist here in Chicago who's one of my favourites, a uh, great artist called Tony Fitzpatrick, and he's created this series of images of birds and each one tells a story and uh, evokes incredible feelings of uh, passion, hope, uh, you know, uh, some some of regret and, and uh, opportunity, but incredible. If, if anybody's listening that hasn't, isn't uh, familiar with Tony Fitzpatrick, I encourage you to become familiar. Um, what's, is there a bird that's out there that's elusive? What do you really want to see? Which, which bird captures your imagination? I, I want to see, um, and I'm not, I don't chase rare species. Um, Thrilled if I happen to see one, but uh, I don't chase around looking for them. What I want, what I want, right, rant, what I want is abundance. I want these creatures to have the abundance that they once had and deserve, you know. So what I do not want to see is an empty field with nothing in it except chemically treated crops, you know. I want there to be no, the birds that the old bird books call common, which mm -hmm. now ain't, you know, that's what I want to see. In plenitude, flocks of birds, not one or two individuals that are hanging on there. So that's what I want. Hallelujah. And the seabird colonies, I, I love, you know, obviously in Scotland here, we have magnificent, had magnificent seabird colonies. And as you say about the Bash Rock, a seabird colony in full cry in May is a, is a joy. Isn't it? Isn't it? I took my- Really noisy, raucous, you know, yeah. and, and thrilling. The, the, the word awesome is so overused, but when I was there, it really was, an awesome sight, sound, and smell. You know, the, you can imagine what hundreds of or thousands of these birds yeah. are like. Speaking of birds, you you've written a couple of poems, which I hope you'll you'll uh, read for us now. I do poems about birds. Yes, always always a pleasure. Never a chore. I can do that. Um, I'll start with a, a big one: an eagle, um, a golden eagle in this case. In in which I saw on the island of Mingulay. It's, uh, the poem's called Halfling, which is a Scots word for an adolescent or a half-grown, especially a boy. Halfling. Bird on the cliff top, the angle of your back a master stroke. Why should kittywakes plunge at your head with white shrills? You're only just falling from your parents' care. They've dared slope off together to quarter the island's only glen, leaving you sunlit, burnished, glaring out to sea like one bewildered. Some day soon you'll topple to the winds and be gone, a gangrel obliged to wander island to mountain, taking your chances till you molt at last to an adult's mantle and settle some scant estate of your own. Already the gulls shriek, eagle, eagle. They know more than you what you'll become. And another bird, what I'm very fond of, is a dipper. I don't know if you have such a thing in North America. A dipper is a, a, a bird that lives in freshwater streams and can, and can fly underwater. And they, they sit on rocks in the most incredible, you know, rushing rivers. A little bird be sitting there bobbing up and down, hence the name. And they're the only birds in our country which sing all year round, 
which explains why I heard this one singing in mid-November. The Dipper. It was winter, near freezing. I'd walked through a forest of firs when I saw issue out of the waterfall a solitary bird. It lit on a damp rock and as, as water swept stupidly on, wrung from its own throat, supple, undammable song. It isn't mine to give. I can't coax this bird to my hand that knows the depth of the river, yet sings of it on land. Wow, that's beautiful. <laughs> Kathleen, you were given the 2017 Royal Geographical Society's Ness Award for oh. outstanding creative writing at the confluence of travel, nature and culture. You, you clearly are very proud of that description. Tell us why it means so much to you. I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm also very thankful for it. You know, if I'm at a party, for example, and people say, oh, what do you do? And I screw up my courage and say, I'm a writer. And inevitably they'll say, they'll say, oh, what do you write? And I could never, never, never say, I could never describe what I did until they came along with that description. And I can now say, yes, my writing sits at the confluence of nature, culture and travel. Perfect. I was so glad. <laughs> <laughs> and, and often as writers, we need other people to tell us what it is we do. We need critics. We need people who describe ourselves back to us. Because half the time, we don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. I just write this stuff and hope for the best. Yeah, yeah. So to have somebody receive it, understand it, and give me back that perfect description, as I say, I was very grateful. Well, your works cover national identity too. And you give voice, you gave voice to the vote for Scottish independence in 2014 by committing to write a poem a week to capture the mood of the country in your own way. That collection published in 2015 is called The Bonniest Company. The day you were appointed Macker, uh, Brian Wilson from The Scotsman quoted you as saying, an independent green horizon gives me hope. Mm -hmm. How does Scotland's macker see the mood of the Scottish people today? Well, I think I'd like to backtrack a wee bit on that question and say when I wrote, when I was writing the book that became The Bonniest Company, I wasn't making a political, I wasn't taking a political side. What was thrilling was the level of debate in Scotland, and the political debate, which just went, somebody said it was like living in an open air university which it suddenly was, suddenly everybody of every political view was talking about these things, these things that mattered. We were learning, we were teaching each other, we were reading, we were writing, we were talking. I could overhear people on the top of a bus having intense political conversations, you know? And it was, for a brief while, it was fabulous. Mm -hmm. No matter if you agreed with your, your person or not, they were, we were our own people talking about our own future and how it should be, you know, how we should go about it. And it was thrilling. And that sense of energy I wanted to catch in my writing. I did not want to write political blogs. Plenty of other people were doing that. I wanted to write poems and I didn't want to write political opinion. So I thought I will try and just ride this energy, surf this energy and write a poem a week. There's not a political poem in that book, you know, and all that other stuff. Since then, you're asking me where we are now. Stuck, I think. Yeah stuck. I don't think any of us knows, well, the pandemic got in the way, of course, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know where we are. And that sense of energy has certainly dissipated. We're all exhausted. We're exhausted with this pandemic and we're exhausted just with the political situation we find ourselves in, I think. We're exhausted by the binaries that we all seem to be trapped in. You know, where did they come from? Exactly, exactly. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I wonder, as we kind of close, come to 2.45 and, and open for questions, uh, one more question before we do that. If we were to be walking through the streets of Edinburgh, Glasgow, wherever, um, Ayrshire, uh, any town, and Robert Burns was with us today, what do you think his eyes would see and how do you think he would feel? I haven't the first idea. <laughs> So we have to imagine a man, uh, him reborn in the 21st, no, a 21st century man brought up in the same environment as the rest of us. I think 
And what do I think? Well, how are we to know? I think he's a decent guy, born in you know circumstances that none of us would have flourished in. No, I think he'd be a decent guy. What more can we say? He'd be a decent guy. That's a good point to to um, to bring in another decent guy. Uh, I want to before I do thank you for for this incredible conversation. I, I thank feel you, thank you. Feel really. Uh, um, like I want to go out and grab a pair of binoculars, despite the fact that it's minus ten in Chicago right now, and and go. Oh, the sky is clear. Is it blue sky? Is it cold? Blue sky is very clear, oh, yeah, very lovely. bright. Yeah. Um, but to to kick off our our questions now, I'm I'm delighted to welcome my friend from for the the Scottish Business Network in Washington D.C. himself, a poet too, um, mm -hmm. Ian Houston, to ask our first question. Hello, Ian. Hello, I'm here, Gus. Sorry, it took a bit for me to come in. So, can everyone see me okay? Can you both see me? We can, can see you. We can see hear you. you fine. There, now you can there see you me. Yes. So, I'm proudly wearing, it was important for you to see me, I'm proudly wearing my Chicago Scots shirt. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. so, first of all, I would just say what a remarkable conversation this has been. Thank you to you, Gus what you do, how you lead, and Chicago Scots for what you do, just the inspiration that you are uh, to me personally, but collectively the team. Thank you, Chicago Scots. Kathleen, thank you so much. Some of your readings were stunning. Thank you. I think, I think the audience would agree with me just to sit here, and this is one of the, the best sessions that I have been on uh, LinkedIn or Zoom, wherever, for a long time. <laughs> yeah, we have to please. Thank you so much. Um, for me, I, I, I thought it was quite poignant thinking about you writing just as a, a wee girl, thinking through and just talking about going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, just And I think of that, the girls somewhere in the world having the exp same experience today, uh, sketching out poetry and ideas and uh, thinking about her place in the world and nature, etc. And the manner in which she can go forward and the people who will be encouragers to her wherever she is in the world. It uh, could be a, a, a child in Tanzania. I have no doubt of that, of, of, of someone in the world who needs encouragement. Do you in your role, you spoke about your role and sort of that job description, if you were to pull it up, do you feel that there could be coordination or is there coordination amongst uh, other poet laureates? I'm here in Washington, DC, uh, internationally with other individuals uh, who share a similar title to you, whereas there's the sharing of information, the sharing of best practices. I think Scotland is one of the best in terms of how it does it, but perhaps there could be other countries in the world who can learn from that. So. Is there that type of activity, sharing of information, encouraging other poet laureates or uh, leader I, share titles? Not, not at the minute to my knowledge, but it is on my list of, of things to do is to find out which countries do have national poets. Uh, not, every not every country does, mm. uh, but how marvelous it would be for those of us who do exist to, to link up together. Yes. And, you know, with Zoom, of course we could do this. You know, yes. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's a terrific idea. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, it, it just, again, so inspirational, your, your readings. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you, Chicago Scots, for bringing this program on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. I, I have a, a couple of questions um, from... Uh, um, folks who are tuning in, um, Dave Coulter asks, Burns' works are so numerous, are there a few that you might suggest to someone unfamiliar with him as an entry point to his world? Last year, now I'm fumbling around my computer now, uh, myself, Don Patterson and Peter Mackay edited a big anthology of Scottish poems over the last thousand years. We called it A Golden Treasury of Scottish Poetry. It's a big tome, but there's maybe a dozen poems by Burns in that. 
And I think I would send anybody to that book, not because I edited it, but because it's yeah, a, a place one could point to, to say what we considered the best of Burns poems is in that book, along with much else, along with the context that he was working in. So a treasury of Scottish poetry, a golden treasury of Scottish poetry. A golden indeed. Um, we're, we're here at Caledonia Senior Living, our, our nursing home uh, here, kind of secluded beautifully in the woods, just 15 minutes west of downtown Chicago, but mm -hmm. we're, it's a very peaceful and serene setting. And the residents are in our living room, and I'll say hello to them all because they're tuning in and, right. and listening. Uh -huh. um, but I have a question from one of them. Uh -huh. um, what period of your life do you find you write about most often? Childhood, teenager, young adult, or any time in particular? I'm, I'm very much now. Wherever now is, now is where I'm writing from. Occasionally, very rarely, um, I'll have a memory of some time past and write about that. But that's very rare. Um, everything comes about the experience of, of where I am in my life is, is what I'm writing from. So right now, as I say, I turned 60 this year. So, so I'm coming to an age where most of my life is behind me. And I'm starting to feel that sense of passing on you know, to my own children and to the young, younger generation. You know, But at the same time, I'm still active. I'm not ready to relinquish anything. So it's, um, yeah. mm -hmm. they've never not been interesting. Every decade, I've been into every, every decade thinking, oh God, that's it, that's finished now. And they've always been fascinating. Mm -hmm. So if my 70s and 80s are equally fascinating, then yeah, bring it on. I wouldn't go back to my 20s. No? No, no, not a difficult one. But So no, my, my, my writing comes out of where I am, I think. I think I'd rush back to my 20s because I have a lot of people to apologise to. <laughs> <laughs> that actually leads us into to the next question from Anne-Marie Crow. Are you involved with youth of all ages in workshops? What are some of the ways you reach them with your poetry and how do you inspire and motivate them to write? Did you say young people in particular? Yes. Yeah, I've rather lost touch with young people. I used to teach at university, and since I gave that up a year and a half ago, I realised I'm losing touch with, with younger people, and this is something I need to want to rectify, if not now as Maka, but, but very soon. I do not want to become one of these older people who have no touch with young ones. So I absolutely need to, to work on that. So how to inspire them? I think they inspire me. I think they're perfectly capable of doing that bit themselves. You know, they just need... But, you know, what we all need as writers, regardless of age, is space, I think. Permission, permission's a big one, and, and space. Yeah. And sometimes a peer group, but social media is taking over that. But permission is space, and then I do believe the rest of it will look after itself. There, there are a few questions here in the chat, which kind of lead on quite nicely. Um, Barbara um, asks, what made you start to appreciate the nature around you and start writing poems about your experience? I always, as a young woman, uh, appreciated the nature around me. But as I said before, when I was young, it was a bit cranky. Nowadays, it's not, thank God, nowadays it's not. But back then, it was a bit weird, a bit cranky. I vividly remember um, having in my bedroom a, a poster of a cheetah, a young cheetah, mm. about to pounce. And I remember taking that down and replacing it with a poster of the Bay City Rollers because that's what you did. You know? <laughs> and I sometimes think now, had my teens been different and I could have kept with the cheetahs and the other thrilling wildlife, maybe my whole career would have been different. So I was always interested, but couldn't, couldn't articulate it, couldn't say it until I got old enough you know, and thought to myself, why am I not writing about the natural world? Mm. I love it. I love seeing animals. I love, seeing them. I love it. Why on earth am I not writing about it? And then, of course, the, the environmental movement was starting to rise at that point. And so, you know, it became apparent that something had to be done. Yeah. But uh, thank you, Barbara Parisi, for that question. And, and moving to Christopher Thompson's question um, How do you think poetry keeps its power across different languages, including Scots, which can be particularly hard for folks overseas? Yeah. Um, how does poetry keep its power? I'm not, I'm not terribly sure what 
you mean? Do you mean um, what, if a poem is translated into another language or is poetry in every language powerful? I, I, I think, um, I don't want to ask the question and speak for Chris himself, but uh, for me it would be how, if a poem is translated, how would it keep its power? Uh, but let's have a go at both. I think that's down to the translator, isn't it? You know, translating is, is an underrated skill. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so much of the translation is, is getting the tone of the poem into the target language as well as the actual vocabulary. So um, I remember hearing the, the Russians when I was young, some of the, the Russian poets who are all power. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you could hear the power in the original Russian and how that came over into English it didn't always work to my ear. But as I say, surely it's down to the, to the translator. Um, poetry and, and, and a poem doesn't have to be powerful, but every culture, every language, to my knowledge, has poetry or something like it. Every language that exists, imagine that, or ever existed. So there's something powerful in poetry, something that every language finds a way of manifesting it. He said something about Scots being, being difficult. I think that's, um, it ought to be, it's a different language. You know, Scots at its full blast it is a different language to English, so it shouldn't be any more comprehensible than French is, but it's easy to learn. If you can have, if you can hear English, you can learn Scots very quickly, because they're, mm. they're so closely related. Well, speaking of power and powerful poems and powerful people, um, the world uh, looked on at President Biden's inauguration uh, and um, Elizabeth Rector, um, hi Libet, how are you? Asked the question of Amanda Gorman. Uh, speaking of youth, have you communicated with or heard Amanda Gorman, the African-American young poet? Well, I, I saw her at the inauguration um, speaking of... God, she was beautiful. <laughs> and that's, that's how, I think, that's how the world knew her name, you know, at that, that one event. So that, that's my, my experience of her. And my goodness, what an experience, how wonderful. Mm. I, uh, I want to thank everybody for, for tuning in and, and encourage you to, to be with us again on February the 5th when the uh, Scottish History Forum will welcome Professor Sir Tom Devine. Uh, well, who's going to talk about uh, Scotty, Scotland and uh, he, he um, I hope will talk about the Scottish Enlightenment and uh, and what uh, caused this kind of incredible moment in the world's history in, in Scotland. Uh, so that's February the 5th uh, on in the morning, that's the Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Chicago time. Um, but Kathleen, on behalf of everyone who who enjoyed today's discussion live and everyone who will down the line. Thank you so very much. Oh, my pleasure. My I, pleasure. Uh, I, in, in 2020, the Chicago Scots presented the inaugural Mackers Medal to our pal Jackie Kay uh, mm -hmm. to recognize the impact she had and all she accomplished during her term as Macker when, when her term came to an end. And as you begin your term, I, I commit the Chicago Scots support to you. Uh, I look forward to working with you in the times ahead and and one day in those times ahead to presenting you with the Mackers Medal. When oh, I'd be thrilled. To come to <laughs> Chicago. I'd be thrilled. Thank you so much. So on behalf of the Chicago Scots, thanks, be well, Thank and, and Thank happy you. birthday, Robert Burns. Nice. Good night, all. Take care. Take care.